Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Teacher Takeaway Series Season 2. This is Webinar 5. Today, Ian Kelly, Educational Consultant for the British Council, will present on using digital resources to develop intercultural communication and global citizenship in English classrooms. This webinar series is associated with the British Council's Teaching English platform, an English teacher's community filled with teaching and learning resources. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the chairperson of this webinar series and a professor in the Department of English Education at SNUE. As an academic consultant for the British Council, I developed the Teacher Takeaway webinar series for Korean English teachers, seasons one and two. Let me introduce today's presenter, Ian Kelly, Educational Consultant, British Council. He has worked in English language education for the last 18 years. He has taught adults and children of all ages and worked extensively in teacher and examiner training and management. Having worked in Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Asia, and in both public and private education systems, he is keen to share his experiences of how best to engage learners with topics that challenge us all as global citizens in the modern world. I'm very grateful, Ian, for taking the time to share his insights tonight in this webinar. Now, please join me welcoming Ian Kelly with a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Gyeongja. Thank you for the nice warm welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here, and hopefully I can tell you uh, a lot of interesting things, interesting ideas, which will help you to engage your students in these in these issues. Uh, you might notice that I've given my my webinar perhaps a a long and convoluted title. Some people might think uh, intercultural communication and global citizenship. Uh, so first, let's start with the, the elephant in the room. Uh, what is intercultural communication? So in the, the chat box, if you could sh share your thoughts as to what this is, uh, it can just be a bullet point. Uh, it doesn't have to be a 10 paragraph explanation, but just a little bullet point as to what this might mean. If anyone has any ideas, please share. Very silent in the chat box so far, which is good because it means I can teach you something. Filling cultural gaps. Thank you very much, Suhi. getting to know about other cultures, exactly, communicating with people from diverse cultures, lots of great ideas here, exchanging ideas, understanding between people from different cultures, he song, that's a great way to put it. So we can guess what this is if we if we don't know, and these ideas are, are really good examples of it. We've got the word inter, and we've got the word cultural. So. All these things that people have written are exactly correct. So when I talk about intercultural communication, it can be referring to communication between people from two different cultures. Nice and easy. Getting a little bit more complex, this definition, uh, it's symbolic, interpretive, transactional. People from different cultures create shared meanings. Uh, and that's something uh, Shin Yong wrote in the in the comments. So getting to know about other cultures. Uh, it's an interactive process. I learn about another culture and another culture learns about me. Uh, a third definition I've got here. So intercultural, intercultural communication 
refers to the effects on communication behavior when different cultures interact together. One way of viewing intercultural communication is a communication that unfolds in symbolic intercultural spaces, so shared spaces. And nowadays, we can think of most of the world as being a shared cultural space. Uh, I know a lot of you in, in, this, in this group are in, in Korea. Korea is increasingly multicultural. I've lived here for 10 years, and I can see huge changes in that time. And I'm sure compared to when some of you were born 20 or 30 or more years ago, there have been even bigger changes. So intercultural communication is that. Global citizenship. Can anyone write in the chat what they think that might be? Having a global mind, thank you, Sonny. That's a good way of phrasing it. Being a member of a worldwide community, another excellent way of putting it. Embracing others, thank you, Yonjin. I love that. That's a lovely, friendly way to, to put it. Uh, and in many ways, that's what it's about. It's about understanding and embracing, accepting others. Uh, being a citizen of the world, thank you, Natalie. Uh, so someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. They are a citizen of the world. They take an active role in their community. They work with others to make our planet more peaceful, more sustainable and, and fairer. So this is really just exact, uh, expanding on, or you're expanding on these ideas with your, your comments in the chat, like, uh, Chanel's written inclusivity, Layla's written meaningful human existence. These ideas go far beyond what, what I've put on the screen. Uh, I just took this as a very simple definition from the, the Oxfam website. Uh, Hejong, thank you. An awareness as a member of the world. Uh, Heyun, an identity as a citizen of global society. So all of these are ideas of global citizenship. We're not just one person living in one country or living in one city even. We are members of a, a global community. Uh, it's very easy for us to spend our entire lives, if like many of you do and I do, living in Seoul. We, we often don't need to leave Seoul very much. There's basically everything we, we want here. But there is a world beyond that. And it's important that we as educators and our students as the future generations understand that. And my lecture today is about promoting that, promoting that in our classrooms and specifically our English language classrooms. Uh, there's some, some other great comments in, in, the, uh, in the chat here, so do please read through them. I, I don't have time to read through every single one, I'm sorry. Uh, so you obviously all know what this idea is. So. A very quick question, yes or no, are these important for our students? Yes, 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 yes. I'm waiting for someone to say no. Yes, more and more, yes, yes, yes. Perfect. So nobody said no, which is what I'm hoping for. Because obviously, as I've just said, we all live in this world and we don't live in isolation. It's not just me and my family in my apartment. I live in an apartment, which is in an apartment building, which is in an apartment complex, which is in uh, Gu in Seoul, which is in the city of Seoul, which is in the country of Korea, which is in Asia, which is in the world. And all of it is increasingly interconnected. So of course, this is all important for our students. So then my next question, and in terms of why am I here and why am I talking to you about this? Is the English classroom the best place to develop these skills in our students? And I'm saying develop here because all students have these skills. All humans naturally have a curiosity. We're trying to develop that curiosity and to make sure that people can exploit it, can interact with it, can make the most of it. 
so I think the English classroom is one of the best places to, to do this. And especially within a school environment, it's a very natural place to do this. So a few reasons why, if anyone wants to put any ideas in the chat to add to my, my thoughts, then do please feel free. Uh, I've put language and culture are inherently intertwined. So therefore, in our classroom environments, it's natural when we look at our textbooks or when we speak to the native teachers in our classrooms or when we just speak in a different language, there are cultural differences that arise. So one of the most interesting things I've found about teaching English in Korea with adults is that when people speak in English, the levels of formality that we have when we're talking to different ages, when we're speaking in Korean, instantly disappear, disappear. So there's a whole cultural hierarchy which we have when using Korean language, which we don't have when using the English language. So I can have a classroom of students speaking in English and it's all very informal. And then when it gets to break time, suddenly people are being more respectful when they're speaking in Korean. And there's nothing wrong with either of those, but it's very interesting to see how language and culture do mix like that. So an English language classroom is a natural place that we're going to encounter these cultural differences. It's important in any lesson, in any subject, that we respond to what the students say as well. Students often just come up with questions. They're, they're naturally inquisitive. And when those are questions that are about cultural and about the world, then even if it's not on the syllabus, it's important that we respond to it, we acknowledge it, and we try to help the child understand, help the class understand. Maybe we can't always do it right there and then, but that can feed into our lesson planning and how we want to shape what we're doing with our students. Learning a language is about communication. So intercultural communication is obviously something that our students want to talk about or hopefully want to talk about. And we have the freedom in an English language class to use language to talk about anything. We have a curriculum, of course, we have to stick to that, but we can supplement that and we can use really authentic, natural situations to use language to try and help motivate the students a lot of the time to use the language and be more interested in the, the lesson and what we are doing. So those are my three bullet points there for why I think the English classroom is good for this. If anyone has any others, then do feel free to put them in the chat and we can mention them. So we have these two ideas, intercultural communication, global citizenship, and I want to think next about how we develop these skills. And obviously it's a process, it's a long process, which I still go through in my adult life and I'm sure all of you do as well. So through this webinar, hopefully I'm going to give you some ideas for that, show you some examples of things that I've done. And the other thing in my title is about how digital resources can help us to do that. Now, obviously, when we're talking about the world, the internet, digital resources are a key part of how we share information with different cultures. So it's fairly obvious to me that this is going to be one of the best ways for us to to do this. Uh, I know a lot of you saw Fraser's lecture last Friday night, the last webinar last Friday night, uh, and he had a lot of good ideas in there for how to take the teaching English resources from the British Council's website and to adapt those. Uh, and in many ways, this builds on that. I have got references to some British Council materials in my webinar today, but I'm also trying to make us think about what other things there are out there which we can use. Uh, that can sometimes be a bit daunting 
if you're going to just find something else and use it. But hopefully I've got a few ideas that show you that we can do this in quite a small and simple way. And when I watched Fraser's webinar last week, one of the things I really liked that he said, and it's something that I was taught 20 odd years ago, was that we can have any authentic resource in our classroom. And we shouldn't adapt the text, but we should adapt the task. The, the mantra he used is exactly the same as the one that, that I learned. So there's anything out there that we can use. And to start with, I'm going to show you uh, a picture. It's taken from uh, a film, and it's a film that you've probably all seen or the majority of you have seen. So it will reveal very slowly onto the screen. And I just want you to type into the, the chat box the name of the film, if you remember the name, or if you don't, you can just write, oh, that film about something or, or whatever it is, just so when you guess, I just want you to try and write it in, okay? Uh, so it'll be about 30 seconds for the full image to reveal, but hopefully you can guess it a little bit more quickly than that. Well, hey, some people have guessed. Lots of guesses. Okay, so as a lot of you have seen, this is from the film uh, Coco, which was a, a Disney Pixar film from 2017. Uh, and a very, very good film, in my opinion. So I've put this here under the title of intercultural communication. So what on earth am I talking about when I'm talking about intercultural communication and I'm showing you this scene from this film? And I've very specifically chosen this scene from this film. So is there anything in here that makes you think that this might be a really very relevant intercultural communication point, given that most of us are in Korea? Is there anything that stands out to anyone? If you remember the film or if you can just see from the picture. Okay, so we've got some comments. Celebration of the dead, importance of family, uh, All Saints Day celebration. Uh, yeah, so Sunmin, thank you. Uh, we both, Mexico and Korea, have a memorial day for our family. It's a way of honouring the dead. So I'll just very quickly show you uh, just a 30 second clip from the film. Uh, it's Dia de los Muertos. No one's going anywhere. Tonight is about family. Open the room. Vámonos. Don't give me that look. Dia de los Muertos is the one night of the year our ancestors can come visit us. We put their photos on the ofrenda so their spirits can cross over. That is very important. If we don't put them up, they can't come. We made all this food, set out the things they loved in life, mijo. All this work to bring the family together. So as you could see from that little clip, there's a lot of similarities between what we can see here in this Mexican tradition and what we have when we have Jessa in Korea. We could see that there was food laid out, uh, there were pictures laid out, which... In, in a modern Jessa ceremony, ceremony is, is increasingly common, never used to be. Uh, but we can see that there are definite similarities between what's happening here and what's happening in, sorry, what's happening here in the film and what's happening here in Korea. 
so if we think about our students and I know that in the registrations for today, there were about 45% of people who were middle, uh, sorry, primary school teachers, elementary school teachers. Uh, and then about 35% of people were middle school, high school and university school teachers. So I do know that among the audience, there's a, a range of people teaching a range of ages. But a lot of these ideas, we can adapt them to be done with someone in elementary school or someone in university. So if we think just about the, the picture that you can still see on the screen, uh, there's a lot of similarities between what we have in the offender, which the is the offering in the, the Mexican tradition, and what we would have in a Jessa ceremony in Korea. And if we think about intercultural communication, a lot of that is about us understanding our own culture, our Korean culture, and then being able to explain it to others. And for us to understand other cultures and see the similarities as well as the differences to it. it it's very common for our, our young students, especially, to think that Korea is different to everything else. Because everyone naturally feels that we are different to, to everyone else because we grow up knowing that we are Korean and we speak Korean. Or I grow up knowing I'm English and in England we do this. But we can also see as we grow older, as we learn through experiences like this in our classrooms, that we have many, many similarities with other cultures, other countries, etc. So this is one very short and very simple little idea of how we can integrate some intercultural communication into our classroom. Do I have to watch the entire film in order to use this example in my classroom? Of course I don't. But when we're talking about an Jessa, for example, when we're talking about culture, when there's something in our textbook which is is referencing that or something about Mexico, then it's a perfect opportunity for us to find the links between that and us. So when we've got your, your English language textbooks, a lot of them do spend a lot of time looking at different cultures, different places. And I know having taught young students that they'll often think, oh, Mexico, what's Mexico? Don't know, don't care, long way away, something like this. Or maybe their image of Mexico is just Aztecs, or maybe it's just a beach or something like this. But by showing them the similarities with just a short clip from, from this film, we can see that there are a lot of similarities and it helps to humanize other people. Uh, Suhi has just written tacos in in the in the chat, and that's probably an even better example than I came up with. Where when people think of Mexico, it probably is Mexican food that that we think of. But whether we're thinking about the food or anything else, we want to be able to think about the different layers of culture. Uh, you could see here there's fruit which is laid out in the offering which again is exactly the same as we often do in, in Korea. We will put out some fruit as part of the, the Jessa ceremony. So lots of different situations where this intercultural communication can arise. Uh, and I'm gonna show you another example now. So again, thinking about intercultural communication and a few years ago, there were some very big uh, fires in Australia. Uh, and you probably saw this on the news and your, your students might well have seen this on the news because there's koalas and there's kangaroos and they're it's trying to escape the, the fires. And it was a, went on for many, many weeks and it was a big, big issue. And Korea also has fires, not as often, not as large, but there are fires often in Gangwon-do when it gets particularly dry, we can have fires. 
So this can be an issue which is quite close to home for some students because they might have seen them, they might live in these areas, they might have family that live in these areas. But when we see it on the news in Australia, we obviously will think, oh no, koalas, kangaroos, etc. But it can often be quite difficult for us to relate to. So what I've got here is something that I took from the uh, British, the BBC website, just talking about the fires in Australia a few years ago. Uh, an estimated 10 million hectares, 100,000 square kilometers have been burnt or have been affected. Uh, so just very quickly, can you write in the chat how big that is? Is that like, I don't know, Big, small, very big, very small. Is it? Is it like, I don't know, like your neighbourhood, or is it like Seoul? What, what do you kind of feel that means when it says a hundred thousand square kilometres? Uh, so I've got one person saying much bigger than Seoul, uh, which is perfectly correct. Much bigger than Seoul. And uh, hey, Yun, thank you for your honesty. It's hard to estimate. Uh, and that to me is, is the perfect example of why this is something important for us to do. When we're thinking about intercultural communication, we want to try and understand and put a something that we can feel when we have a number like this. So on the BBC website, underneath this story, it had this picture of the UK. Uh, so for people that, that know the UK, London is, is down here. And this is Manchester up here. So this is about two hours on a train to come between, no, probably three hours on a train to come between these places. Scotland is, is up here. So we can see that that is a lot of the country. Uh, and when we think about Korea, I think this is a very useful number when we think about Korea, because the size of Korea, or South Korea, is 100,000 square kilometers. So when we think about some fire in Australia and we see some picture of some koala and we're like, oh, the koalas. It's a wonderful thing for students to see that, for students to empathize with that. But to help them understand it, this can be a really powerful way to try and do it. So be it with students reading the news about Australia, be it something has happened in Gangwondo, there are these links that we can make that hopefully help students to then understand about what is happening. Uh, Layla has just written, the whole of South Korea will vanish from the map. Uh, and, and exactly. But obviously, the whole of Australia didn't vanish from the map. And then that can also help us and help our students to understand Australia really is quite a big place. Because when we put this on the map of Australia, it's a tiny, tiny little proportion of it. Still very significant, still millions of animals and birds effective, and obviously the human cost as well, because it burnt towns and villages. But helping our students to understand issues like this and relate to it is something that I feel is really important. And it's something that within our classrooms we can do. Uh, my final example for this is something which I've taken from the, the BBC News website just one hour ago before I, I started this webinar. So this is a news story from India, a uh, news story from yesterday. And obviously, I'm sure you all remember the tragic floods we had in Korea both this year and last year. And Korea is not alone in experiencing this. So helping students to 
understand that what's happening in Korea is also what happens in many other places is a good way of helping that intercultural communication and that idea of global citizenship. We're not alone here. And obviously, there were a lot of problems and a lot of fatalities and casualties during the floods in Korea. But largely, Korea is very well protected from this. And if we think about doing this with different ages of students, then when we're talking about high school students or university students, then this is a great opportunity for them to think about the advantages that Korea has in terms of preparedness for things like this, and to then compare that with things like this situation in, in India just yesterday. Now, obviously, I've just taken the, the headline from this article here, but this article itself was only what seven, maybe eight sentences long. It was a, a very short article just talking about what had happened, uh, why there was so much uh, rain at this particular time because of this cyclone. Uh, and sorry, that's that's another issue. The cyclone is a, another cause which is very similar in terms of what brings all of the the rain to both Korea and to India. So what I said in the in the brief for this lecture was that I try and give you some practical ideas and tips for how we can do this. So finding a news article such as this one is very easy in terms of just type into Google floods India and this comes up or just look at the news web page as I did and see what is is there. And then it doesn't even have to be that we want our students to sit down and read the whole article. We can just have a classroom discussion about it. What's similar? What's different? Because photos like this of people trapped in flood water are very similar, whether they're in the UK, whether they're in India, whether they're in Korea. So this final picture leads very neatly from intercultural communication and talking about these different things into the idea of global citizenship. Because when we think about global citizenship, we often think about the world, and it can be about interconnectedness and intercultural communication, but it can also be about the shared problems of the world. And I'm going to begin this with another slow reveal of a picture as I did with the cocoa thing. This one is a little bit more difficult. So I just want you to try and slowly watch this picture reveal and tell me what can you see? And you'll probably guess what it is, but it doesn't look like it normally does. So try and type in the chat what you think it might be, okay? So lots of people have written World Atlas, but that, that looks like a very strange World Atlas to me. Why have I put such a strange World Atlas on the world map? Ah, Olivia's written Climate Change. It's related to climate change. Uh, it's some, Suhi's written Population. It's not Population, uh, but it's a very good guess. So it is related to climate change. This is from 2015, these statistics, but it's the amount of CO2 emissions. He song, perfect, best guess. Uh, Unsung, ecological footprint. So again, it's the same idea. So if we look at these countries, this is shaped by, well, the size of them is shaped by the amount of carbon dioxide that they are emitting. So we can see here, China emits a lot. Uh, the USA emits a lot. If we look at Western Europe, we've got Germany, Italy, France, the UK, all emitting a lot. Uh, we've got a huge bulging Japan over here and a very huge bulging South Korea here as well. And if we compare it to North Korea there, you can see that there's a huge difference in the amount of 
energy that we are using and CO2 that we are emitting in South Korea. If we look at Africa, you can see Africa has basically disappeared. South Africa is here. Egypt is here. But everything else, there's, there's so much of the world which has just vanished because their CO2 emissions are so much lower than ours are here in, in Korea. And when we go back to this idea of the floods, we can generally all agree that increased flooding, increased climate chaos. It was December today in Seoul and it was 15 degrees or something. This, this is not normal. All of this is largely a result of the, the CO2 emissions that we have uh, collectively around the world. But we can see that the people making these em emissions, Western Europe, North America, East Asia, are not always the people who are affected by them. And when we look at Africa and we see stories on the news of the problems that affect all of the countries in Africa a lot of the time, then we can see that this is quite an important problem in terms of the disparities that there are between the world. So that brings me on to the next point I have of what is a global citizen. So I've got seven things which I've classed a global citizen as doing, okay? So you can see these here, and I've got seven words at the bottom, seven verbs, which should go in these seven, pardon me, which should go in these seven gaps. So would anyone like to volunteer a guess for any of these? If you just write a number and write a verb very quickly, and then we can go through them. Okay, great guess for number one. Great guess for number seven, excellent. Yeah, number two, apply, good answer. Yeah, number three, build, perfect. Uh, number one could definitely be C, it makes sense. But the answer I've got for, for number one is uh, explore. So explore the complexity of global issues and engaging with multiple perspectives. And if we think about this, then... There's a lot that's really important for us to, to do when we think about engaging with multiple perspectives. And I'm going to come on to, to two examples of that in a few minutes. Uh, the second one, apply learning. So what students might learn in a science class, in a biology class, in a history class, in an English class, they have to put that into a real world context to help them understand. Build their own understanding of world events. So this is something that all of us do. We might read something in a newspaper, see something on a TikTok video, get told something by a colleague or a friend. And we think, well, how much do I trust that? I have to learn what things I trust, what things I need to be a bit more skeptical about. And eventually, I do build my own understanding of the world and how things happen. Think about their values and what's important to them. And again, this is something that I'll come back to in a few minutes time when, when I'm thinking about engaging with multiple perspectives. Challenge ignorance and intolerance. And again, this is something which anyone can do at any point and children might do it to each other in a classroom so I, I teach a lot of young children in Korea and if I make if I mention uh, Japan or if I mention China there's normally at least one person who says something a little bit negative about Japan or China 
And I understand why they say this, because there's a lot of that sentiment. But a lot of the time, children don't understand where that sentiment comes from. And children really shouldn't be making quite such negative comments without understanding things. And at a young age, children don't understand things. Uh, and even when we move into to adulthood, a lot of us, myself included, all of you, I'm sure, we do on occasion make comments which we, we shouldn't do. And we should challenge our own ignorance and we should challenge our own intolerance of things to help us to build our own understanding of how things work in the world. But obviously, if we encourage students to do this from a young age, then that's going to make it easier for them in life in general. And it will, of course, lead to better intercultural communication, lead to people being better global citizens. See that they have the power to act and influence the world. And you can think of a number of examples of people like uh, Malala, the, the teenager from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, sorry, who uh, challenged uh, the, the social norms in that country, uh, as well as people like Greta Thunberg, who have done so much to promote causes that she is passionate about. And both of those did that when they were still only teenagers. So helping students to understand that they can do this is important in shaping their future as global citizens and therefore shaping the future of, of our world. Uh, Layla's just put about the first uh, woman driver in Saudi Arabia, another great example of, of people who do bring about change. Uh, and then this last thing, get involved in local, national and global communities. And I'm going to have an, an example of, of that, which we can think about in our school situations. So if you're a primary school teacher, you might be sitting here thinking, why am I listening to all of this? How does this make any sense to me in a primary school, in an elementary school in Korea? So hopefully on the next page, I can try and give you a little bit of something simple that we can do. And we can do quite regularly with our, our students to try and begin to foster these ideas and this understanding of the world from a very young age. So one very simple question, how interconnected is our world? And I've got some pictures here. Music, literature, food, clothing. And if we think about all of those, if you just look at what you're wearing today, was that made in Seoul? Was that made in Korea? Was it made in Asia? Or was it made somewhere else? I, I looked at uh, 10 of my my clothes, the, just the first 10 I picked out. Uh, a number of them were from China and Vietnam, but there was also something made in Sri Lanka, something made in Spain and something made in Mexico. So I'm sitting here in Seoul and I'm sure some of my clothes are made in Korea, but not from the first 10 that I picked out of my of my drawer earlier today. So something that you can do with your students in a in a classroom in primary school. Think about your day so far today, and in what ways have you interacted with the rest of the world? Where are your clothes from? Where are your shoes from? Your food, music, videos you've watched, something you've read, have you used the internet? All of this shows us our interconnectedness. Uh, so obviously students aren't going to take their clothes off to find their labels in class, but they probably do have their jacket sitting on the back of their seat and they can look and see the label and see what it says. They can look at the music they've been listening to. It might well be Korean, but we also know that in Korean bands, there are singers from the Philippines, Thailand, New Zealand, China probably elsewhere. I'm sure all of you are far more knowledgeable about K-pop than me. If we think about the food people eat, then obviously we have Korean food. But if we think about something like jajamyeon, is that Korean food? Yeah, it is Korean food, but it's also 
historically Chinese food. It's something that we've taken and we've adapted and it's become Korean food. Uh, Hyun Suk's just written in the chat, everything is pretty much interconnected. And that's just so true. And that's one thing that we can get people to think about from a very young age to appreciate the way the world works. The fact that their clothes, their shoes, the music they listen to, that TikTok video they were watching, it could come from anywhere, literally. Hundreds of millions of people all around the world using TikTok, using Instagram and sharing it. And that's all helping us to become global citizens. But it's also important that we understand some of where that comes from. So this is a really simple activity. Uh, you've probably just done it subconsciously yourself, thinking, oh, yeah, what did I have for lunch today? Or what was that video I watched? Or oh, I saw that film at the weekend that was an... American film, Korean film, maybe a Japanese film. But if you go to some places, you might find an Indian film. You might find some French films, etc. So if we're doing an activity like this, how surprised are you by your list? When you think about the countries you have subconsciously perhaps interacted with today, I imagine you were a bit surprised. Was it easy to think about? I would hope that it was. It might have taken a few seconds for you to think, oh, yeah. Or you might have had to look inside your jacket and, and see what the label said. But it's something that even for primary school students, we can get them to do. And we be begin to develop ideas of global citizenship and this idea of interconnectedness and understanding. Could your students do this activity? Yes or no? For primary school teachers, can anyone write a yes if you're a primary school teacher? Excellent. People writing yes, that's what I like. And is it important for them to do it? A lot of the time when I, I do teacher training sessions online or face to face, teachers often say to me, oh, I've got this curriculum. I have to do this page of the book. I have to do this. I agree with all of that. But how long would it take to do this? You could do this in three minutes, maybe five minutes at the start of the class, at the end of the class. You could do it once in summer. You could do it once in winter. You could do it more frequently, you could do it about clothes one day, you could do it about food the next day. So there's a huge range of options for us to do this as just a very quick little thing that we can add as a, a warmer to one of our lessons. Or if a lesson finishes early, we could do something like this. So when we were on this page, I said I'd come back to these ideas of engaging with multiple perspectives and thinking about what's important to them. And I want you to think about your students. And I've got a question. Do your students ever complain about the pollution in Korea? Do you yourself also ever complain about the pollution in Korea? No, Hyun Suk says not really. Um, so lucky you, Hyun Suk. I know a lot of students complain because when there is the, the yellow dust that someone else has mentioned, uh, they're not allowed to go outside and do uh, do a PE outside. They have to stay inside and think things like this. Or maybe just walking to work, walking to school. If they walk to school, you can often tell when you're breathing when there's a, a lot of pollution. Uh, another question. I'm sure this is one that uh, they do complain about. So if we think about the pollution and if we think about the air conditioning, then these are great opportunities to explore the complexity of global issues, getting students to think about their own values and the impacts of decisions that they make. If it's really cold in winter or if it's really hot in summer, 
I imagine a lot of students are like, oh, mum, dad, please drive me to school. And most parents will drive them to school. But obviously, the impact of these decisions, millions of school children driving just maybe five minutes down the road when they could walk it in 15 minutes, this is all leading to the increasing temperature, which means we need to put on the air conditioning. It's leading to the increasing pollution, which means we can't go outside and do PE. It's leading to the increasing CO2, which is causing the flooding, which is causing the forest fires, the bushfires in Australia. So getting students to think about their own priorities in life, how some days I, I do really want to go in the car today. It's just too cold. But on other days, maybe I should be better. I should think about the greater consequences of these multiple little car journeys. And then even though it's cold or even though it's hot, I'm going to walk to the bus stop and wait for the bus or I'm going to walk all the way to school. These are really important things for students to try and think about and to try and understand why we all make decisions like that and how perhaps we want to change on some occasions our decisions. So uh, I've only got a few minutes left. So I said I'd show you a few things which we can find on the, the British Council website, which can help you with ideas such as this. So the British Council website, climate resources for school teachers. And there's lots of different things in here. Uh, I'm just going to show you uh, one very quickly. So if you let me drag it onto my, my screen here. So you can see this is a, a 43 page PTF, PDF, Schools Connect Zero Waste, tackling climate change through student leadership. Obviously, there's lots and lots of things in here. I've not got time to go through everything with you. And just like Fraser said last week, this is not something that you're going to use all of. This is the kind of thing that you're going to look at and you're going to adapt it. And you're going to say, ah, oh, yes, I just want that little bit there. But you can see there's lots of stuff in here which you, you can use. And as you noticed, that's where I took this rather nice map from. Uh, but one of the things in there which you can do, uh, and it relates to what I said earlier about students knowing that they can get involved, that they do have the power to act. And this talked about local, national and global communities. So one of the things in that booklet is about an action plan for your eco school project. So does your school recycle enough? Does your school leave the air conditioning on after people leave or leave the lights on? There's lots of things like this, which we can do in our very small local communities, our school communities. And that's something that students can take leadership in. And if students at the age of 14, 16, 18 are learning how to take leadership, how to take action about things like that, then that's what creates the next generation of people like Malala, like Greta Thunberg. If you are teaching older ages, uh, then this is a book which I've read with a group of students before. Uh, it's about a, a Sudanese, it, 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 it tells two stories in parallel. Uh, it's based on a true story. So it tells the story of a, a Sudanese boy and about his quest to, it, it, he was a refugee, he moved to Canada, I believe it was. Uh, and it talks about his quest to, to do something to help uh, Sudan and help uh, water supplies in Sudan. Uh, it won the, the Newbury Medal, which is a, an award for books for children. Uh, it, it's a very readable, very interesting book. And it has a, a parallel storyline. So it talks about his life and about trying to create uh, something, uh, building an NGO that helps to, 
to provide water in Sudan and also talks about the, the life of a child in Sudan living in the, the hardship that there is. Uh, and the, the hardship primarily being about the supply of water. So that's just one idea for something which you could, if you've got high school students, if you've got university students, then that's something which could be, uh, if you've got the, the time in your curriculum or if you've got motivated students that you can send away to read on their own, this is something that could be could be really good for you. Uh, it, it is designed for, for uh, speakers of native speakers of English, but designed for like ages 11, 12, 13. So it, it is perfectly possible for, for middle school students as well, if you've got competent middle school students. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you as something which is a really good book for helping to develop these ideas. Uh, OK, I want to make sure we've got a few minutes for question and answers. Uh, I have a few references here, but basically the, the, the key things are, are what hopefully I've explained to you. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for coming and for listening to me. And I hope it's been interesting, insightful. I hope, it, I hope it's given you some ideas about what you could do in, in your classrooms. And I do hope that you can take these ideas, use them and inspire that global citizenship, that interconnectedness, develop that intercultural communication in, in your students uh, that will begin to make the world uh, an increasingly better place, I hope. So thank you very much all for, for listening. Uh, do please ask any questions uh, and yeah. Good luck. Thank you very much for your excellent, informative, insightful presentation, Ian. Uh, we have some questions from the audience, so uh, let me ask you a few of them. So uh, let me read aloud the question for you. Thank you. Can you also see the question in the Q&A box in Korean um... elementary? English classes, cultural education often involves watching videos that showcase the characteristics of various countries. Instead of delving deeply into the culture, the focus is on learning key expressions related to the topics in the textbook. Is there a way to address this and integrate culture more meaningfully into the lessons? Oh, obviously, the, the textbook is a, a starting point for any lesson. So I, I find a lot of textbooks anywhere in the world are simplified. So just like uh, the, the person has said in, in the question, uh, it's learning key expressions related to a topic. But often those expressions will relate to the topic and therefore the wider culture which, which it's in. So it should be that you can take what's in the book and then build on it to make it into a more cultural experience. You will obviously need to add to it, and that could be through using a, a video like I did with Coco, or taking something from uh, a news article or something else that you've found, an, another medium at, at all, and any medium at all can be used. And I think that Integrating it is is key, uh, and integrating it meaningfully is is even more important because the students are going to learn that language far better if they are using it in a meaningful context. So you you might make a you might want to make a, a little class video, for example, to talk about this. What whatever your textbook's doing, you could make a class video which you can then upload to the schools. Uh, YouTube channel or you can put on your your TikTok or whatever else it might be because then you're communicating and you have an audience to communicate with you could just share it with another class in the school you could share it with another teacher in Korea or if you have the the network with students in other classes outside Korea so I I think that those expressions that that, that the book has using them meaningfully will almost always involve putting them into a, a good context 
and that should make it more meaningful. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, and can I ask you some more questions? Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the next question is, would these materials be helpful to all different national ESL students, not only for the students in Korea? Definitely. I mean, obviously, in 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 this in this webinar, I was I was focusing on on Korea, but I I've as you said in your introduction of me very kindly, I've I've worked extensively in numerous countries, numerous cultures, and the the basic ideas are are things that I've done everywhere. And I, I see no reason why you couldn't do them anywhere at all in the world. The example of uh, cocoa is one that I've used a lot in Korea because there are a lot of similarities between Day of the Dead and, and Jessa. Uh, but there's plentiful other cultures around the world that have similar uh, cultural uh, ancestral rites festivals. So you can doubtless use that single example in many other places or I mean, so many more examples. You pick, pick another Pixar film or pick a, a TV show that there's going to be something which is relevant to, to someone somewhere. And the issues about flooding or about climate change, we know that affects absolutely everyone everywhere. So definitely always applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, maybe this should be the last question uh, today. So I will read it aloud for you. Uh, in the current era, it is evident that generative AI and other educational technologies exert a significant influence on English education. How can we use these technologies to foster the development of intercultural communication skills and promote global citizenship? It's a very interesting question. Uh, a part of me wants to say with difficulty because I don't impressive though artificial intelligence it artificial intelligence is. I I don't feel it can be a substitute for something like intercultural communication, which is inherently about people. And I, I personally wouldn't want to think that we were communicating with another culture without it being a real, genuine communication with, with people. Uh, in terms of promoting global citizenship, then I, I'm sure there are... I, I, I've, I've used uh, chat GPT to, to give me like simple explanations of things. So I'm sure when we come across uh, concepts, ideas, and we want a nice, simple breakdown, then it, it could be useful for that. And it, it's something which can help students to then do it uh, on their own. Uh, instead of going to a Wikipedia article, which is however long, they can just say to chat GPT, give me a one paragraph summary of, but, I also know that chat GPT is not always right. So I'd be very careful of recommending that to my to my students. Uh, it's it's at that stage of technology where it's increasing a lot, but we we don't exactly know what to do with it and how to manage it. Uh, so I'm sure it does have or will have in the future a role. But I think one of the reasons why I love this as a topic and why I've done so many sessions about this is because to me, it's about people. And, and thus, I would shy away from bringing too much artificial technology into it. I like the using of technology to help people communicate, to help people interact. And that helps us to foster that, that global citizenship. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful talk, uh, Ian, and I'd like to express uh, my uh, gratitude to the audience for the thoughtful questions, and I appreciate Ian's impressive, outstanding answers. Do you have any final notes for the Korean teachers and teacher educators this evening? Thank you all for coming, and I, I do hope that you can take away some of these ideas and 
fit them in, in in little pieces and and build on them and expand on them and hopefully inspire your students and also of course inspire your colleagues there's a few hundred of you here today but there's many thousands more people who i'd like to encourage to do all of this so do please share the ideas uh, and good luck doing so and hopefully i i know I, i've looked at the list of names i'm sure i've i've seen a number of you before in uh, in face to face uh, courses that i've done so maybe i'll see you again i do hope so and good luck until then thank you so much for your final notes for the webinar participants thank you so thank much thank you for inviting me gongja thank, mm -hmm. thank you thank you now please take a few moments uh, to complete the British Council online survey. It would take only three to four minutes to complete. You will find a link to the certificate of a set attendance at the end of the survey. Now it's time to wrap up webinar five and the webinar series season two. The theme of season two was teaching English using educational technology and web resources. Under this theme, we had five wonderful talks. I sincerely appreciate the five panelists. Uh, for your uh, remarkable talks about English language teaching. So I believe your talks help improve English classrooms and enhance teacher and teacher educators' continuous professional development. I also extend my heartfelt gratitude to the audience who participated in the webinars Friday evenings. I trust your efforts and time would be rewarding. There might be no end to our learning, but there will be a good way for our learning. I hope this webinar series leads you to an inspiring way for teacher learning and growth. I hope we can meet again soon. Thank you very much for joining webinar five and teacher takeaway series season two. Have a great weekend. Bye everybody. <laughs>